Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to learn about the 2015 Roland Emmerich movie, Stonewall. To help us separate fact from fiction in the movie, I'm excited to be joined by journalist, founder, and the host of the Making Gay History podcast, Eric Marcus. Eric has one of those remarkable careers where I could spend the next 10 minutes just listing all the incredible work he's done over his career. But for our purposes today, I'd like to highlight three key resources that will help you dive deeper into the true story we're going to learn about today. The first is Eric's book called Making History, The Struggle for Gay and Lesbian Equal Rights, 1945 to 1990. That book won the Stonewall Book Award in the nonfiction category in 1993. The second is a more recent book of Eric's called Making Gay History, The Half-Century Fight for Lesbian and Gay Equal Rights. And last, but certainly not least, if you're listening to this, then I know you're a fan of podcasts, so go check out Eric's extremely popular podcast that I mentioned a moment ago called Making Gay History. Okay, now before we get Eric on the line, it's time to set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Danny Winters did not throw the first brick at Stonewall. Number two, the Stonewall Uprising was organized by the first gay rights organization in the world. Number three, the Stonewall Uprising led to the pride parades we see today. Got them? Now, as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and then by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with Eric about the historical accuracy of Stonewall. There's some text on the screen to open the movie that helps gives a little bit of context, so I thought that would be a great place for us to start as well. According to that text in the movie in 1969, federal law in the U.S. prohibits government agencies from hiring homosexuals. They're classified as mentally ill. It's illegal for homosexuals to congregate and be served alcohol, and electroshock therapy is used to cure homosexuality. Can you give a little more historical context around what the laws were like during the timeline of the movie? Well, I can't say those were the best of times. Um, The list that is offered is actually true. In 1953, President Eisenhower signed an executive order banning gay people from federal employment. So that meant if you were found out or they found you out because they they very actively sought out homosexuals and got rid of them, you could easily lose your federal job. I remember reading some of the letters that were sent to people who did the investigations. Uh, This is during, it was called the Lavender Scare. It was concurrent with the Red Scare. But I bet you didn't learn about that in school. Oh, not I did not. No, and neither did I. And I saw a documentary recently called the Lavender Scare about that period of history. And there were people who, in federal government who were very actively involved in rooting out homosexuals. One guy in particular talked with pride about uh, this guy who, whose life he ruined, who then left his office and shot himself. So thousands of gay people lost their jobs. And that included people in the military as well. So the people, <laughs> it's a little hard to imagine now, but gay people were thought to be a security threat because if, uh, since you had to be closeted because you would be fired if you were found out or you could lose your family. So it was a double bind. You could be blackmailed because you had to be closeted, but you had to be closeted <laughs> because if you weren't, you'd lose your job. So it was theorized that gay people were prime targets for being blackmailed by Soviets who wanted to spy on the, uh, on the United States. So I mean, gay people were scapegoated is what it comes down to. But yes, it was, it was, you know, it was considered sinful by churches. And indeed, it was a mental, listed as a mental illness. So if you're a doctor, you can't have a mental illness. If you're a lawyer, you'd lose your license. If you're a school teacher, you can't have mentally ill people teach school. So the pressure on gay people was enormous. And it wasn't until 1961 when a law was passed in Illinois that, uh, that there was at least one state where it wasn't illegal for people of the same sex to engage in sexual relations. 
Yeah, so it was wild. And also, you, you literally, it was against the law, at least in New York State, to serve homosexuals alcohol in a bar. It didn't say in the law that you couldn't serve homosexuals. What it said was that you could not serve people in a, who were disorderly or could create a disorderly environment. And that was used by the state liquor authority in New York to deny gay people the right to be served in bars, which is why the bars were then owned by the mafia or run by the mafia, because they set up a system with the police for payoffs so that these bars could operate. Wow. Wow. So I imagine, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, being illegal for federal employment, but I imagine a lot of private employers also followed suit in that way where they basically followed the federal law, or was it illegal for private employers to employ as well? It wasn't illegal for private employers to employ gay people, but but if you were, you couldn't be out and be a school teacher, you'd be fired. There was such um, uh, such scorn for homosexuals that if you were a lawyer, you could be fired. It's It's so hard for us to imagine now, but I remember interviewing people who were among the first who uh, went to job interviews at law firms and said, I'm gay. And, you know, either you hire me or you don't, but I don't want to work in a place where I can't be myself. I was one of only two out gay people in the uh, newsroom at CBS Morning News in 1988. I'm sorry, I was the only one who was out in the newsroom at CBS Morning News in 1988. I was only one of two journalists out at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism in the class of 1984. We had about 150 uh, classmates. Wow. And that's, that's not that long ago. No, it's not that long ago. No, I, I'm a dinosaur and dinosaurs still walk the earth. No, 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 no. But I mean, <laughs> that's not what I meant. <laughs> I mean, you know, we think of, like you're saying, you know, it's, it's hard to think about now, but, you know, we think of this as oh, not ancient history, right? I mean, it wasn't that long ago that that it, it was that way. It was that way. Yeah. I, I was warned by my professor, warned by my professors that it could ruin my career if I were out. And and he was very much against a classmate and I, who were both out, wanted to do a story on AIDS. The AIDS crisis was unfolding at that time. He was very much against it and said we could catch AIDS through the camera. What? Okay, that, that's, yeah, there's some ridiculousness. So, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But it's it's so hard for us now to imagine what it was like in 1969, how gay people socialized then. The words we used were so different then. Um, today we talk about trans people People didn't identify as such back then, so they were always, they might be identified as gay, or people who identified as drag queens, we might think of today as gender nonconforming. It's even hard to talk about those times because the language today is so different. We talk about the LGBTQ civil rights movement now. There was a homophile movement in the 1960s. There wasn't a gay rights movement. It was called something different, and it wasn't a, 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 a mix of communities. It wasn't LGBTQ people. That has come about over time now. Oh, there, so there, it was more separate than it, than it is now, is what you're saying? Yeah, so right after Stonewall, you would say there was a gay rights movement or a gay liberation movement, and then it was the gay and lesbian movement as women asserted their power. And for the 1993 March on Washington, bisexual people negotiated a spot for themselves. So it was the 1993 uh, March on Washington for gay, lesbian, bi rights, or lesbian, gay, bi rights. T was added later. There was a lot of t- You can't imagine. You know, people now say, you know, we used to get along so well as a group, gay people, you know, years ago. And why do we all have to argue now? Well, we never got along all that well. And there's always been tension between the different groups. We're a much more accepting and embracing movement now than we were back then. And in 69, at the time of Stonewall, the movement was tiny. There were somewhere between 40 and 60 homophile or gay rights organizations prior to Stonewall. Yeah, and only several, several hundred activists in all, in, in the entire United States. Oh, wow. That's a lot smaller than I would have expected. Yeah. Well, speaking of the the timeline there, we kind of get an idea of what, what it was like then, according to at least, you know, in the movie in 1969. But I'd like to ask about the who and the where that we see in the movie. Uh, the movie follows a young man by the name of Danny Winters, and he arrives in New York and almost immediately starts hanging out with a group on Christopher Street in New York, and they make up the main characters in the movie. There's Ray, Orphan Annie, Queen Kong, Quiet Paul and Little Lee. And not to spoil the ending, but we do see, like we see in a lot of movies that are based on a true story, we see the real people in the movie at the end. And it talks about people like Marsha P. Johnson, Bob Kohler, Seymour Pine. But the movie doesn't mention any of the main characters in the movie at the end, only saying that it's dedicated to unsung heroes of the Stonewall riots. 
So as I was watching this, I got the idea that that probably means the main characters are not real, but perhaps they're fictional characters that were designed to tell a story of how not everyone gets their name in the history books, but they can still have an impact on history. So are the main characters in the movie based on real people who were living on Christopher Street in New York City? Well, I think everyone but Danny from Indiana, the main character in the film. Now, this was a very earnest film, I have to say. But what I didn't know, and I read all the criticism of the film when it first came out in 2015, what I didn't realize at the time was that it was a terrible film. <laughs> that it's not, there isn't, it's not just the history that's problematic. It's a terrible movie. And so terrible that at times it was funny when it wasn't supposed to be funny. But one of my, I'd say, acquaintances, friends, colleagues is a man named Martin Boyce, who I've interviewed, who was at Stonewall. He was one of the street kids. But unlike most of the street kids, he had a stable home. He went to private school during the day and did what's called scare drag in the evening with his friends who hung out in Christopher Park across from the Stonewall Inn. And scare drag was partial drag, makeup, long hair out, some women's clothing, but not, not the rest. Um, and Martin was a consultant to the film. And when I asked Martin about it, he said it was actually a lot of it was quite accurate in the portrayals of the people who were there. And I could feel Martin's fingerprints on this because some of the names of the people who were in uh, the, the street kids were names of Martin's friends. And some of the, the characterizations seem to be similar to what Martin has described to me. And I wonder if the character Ray was Sylvia Ray Rivera. Sylvia Rivera, who's become a, is an icon, trans activist, was thought to have been at the Stonewall Uprising, but there's some debate about that or some dispute about it. So, so, so I, I think some of the characters were composites, but the life that was shown in that film of these kids who'd been thrown out, who came to New York, either from, the, from, from New York City itself or from outside of New York, and were living on the streets and making money however they could, mostly by hustling, those stories are true. There's a scene in particular where Danny, the, the blonde, <laughs> it's such a, such a cliche, the blonde boy from Indiana comes to New York and, just, and falls in with this group of street kids and he's going to Columbia and his, his parents reject him and his dad is the coach of the football team and he's on the football team and he falls in love with the, oh my God, it was like, like it, it, it was crushed under the weight of the, the cliches, the numerous, numerous cliches. But in there, there is, there is some historical fact, but Danny is completely made up. There is no Danny from Indiana who threw the first brick at Stonewall. <laughs> okay, well, that was going to be a later question that I asked too, because yeah, he does throw the first I, I, I want to save that, so we can come back to that. You're talking earlier about how it's, it's hard to imagine things. There was something as I was watching the movie that was, it was hard to imagine what it must have been like. And that was the scene where we see Danny in high school and the whole class is watching this educational video, right? It's how not all homosexuals are passive and they like to hang out in public restrooms. And it suggests that your life is going to be at risk if they're nearby, right? And so it just seemed like this propaganda film that they're trying to incite fear and hatred in the schools. Was that something that really happened in classrooms in the 60s? It did. I'm too young to have seen those, those films. I grew up in, principally in the 70s. I was born in 1958 and was 11 years old at the time of Stonewall um, and at PS99 uh, a Public School in New York City, um, although class was out by, by then. But I'd never been to Greenwich Village, although my parents hung out in Greenwich Village. They were, they were beatniks. My dad was a communist. So, um, but I actually didn't see Greenwich Village until after I graduated from high school, even though I lived on a subway line that had a stop in Greenwich Village. That's how sheltered I was, living in what I call the Oklahoma or the Iowa of New York City. <laughs> <laughs> so those, those films were real, and they were shown to classes. And kids were warned about the creepy perv who you're going to come across in the park, and he may you know, offer you a ride in his car, and, and watch out for people like that. And there was an effort to warn young people about the dangers of homosexuality, because they didn't really understand... Their understanding of homosexuality was quite different from our understanding today, you know, that you could be recruited into this life, that there were men lurking in the bushes waiting to drag you into to this life that's so horrible, but if you try it once, it'll be what you do for the rest of your life. The first time I saw those, probably there are a couple of propaganda films that are shown frequently in, as part of documentaries and were included in this film. The first time I saw them, I thought, no, nobody would show that kind of thing. But they did. And you can imagine the terror that it struck in the hearts of young gay people 
um, and what it would do to poison the minds of straight kids in uh, their understanding of their LGBTQ classmates. When I was growing up in New York, in my high school, there was one kind of uh, effeminate gay kid. His name was Monty. And you didn't want to be Monty because he got teased. He got teased mercilessly. There was nobody out in my high school um, in the class of 1976. So I could certainly relate to the experience of, of this kid in Indiana once he was found out being tortured and being thrown out of his parents' house. That was that was something that happened then and happens to this day. Wow. Well, I mean, yeah, I could imagine how if everybody else is saying these are people to watch out for, then it's like, well, of course, that's going to mess you up. If, if that's what you're taught to believe, that's going to mess you up. And that's what I grew up with. I didn't see those propaganda films, but I can tell you when I was a teenager, 15, 16, 17 years old and realized I was gay. I was just, I, 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 and even by then, homosexuality had been removed from the list of mental illnesses. I was crushed. I thought it was the most horrible thing that could happen to me. That I had been the best little boy in the world. I'd done everything right. I was good at school. I didn't take drugs. I didn't stay out late, except for my senior prom in high school. And here I was, this terrible thing that I knew would destroy my life and disappoint my family. And that was, that wasn't so long after Stonewall. It was just, that was uh, in the mid-1970s. Wow. That's, I mean, that's sad. I'm glad that we're starting to make changes to where that's, you know, uh, used today and, and hopefully not nearly as impacted by that. I hear from a range of, of young people, from those who are out and comfortable from an early age and some who wind up in their 20s and 30s still struggling, especially around religion. Yeah, I can see that. Going back to the movie, when we see Danny arriving in New York City, he gets a, a brutal welcome. I mean, it, there's a point where he, he's going, he's looking for Ray. The police raid the area. There's absolutely no hesitation on the part of police whatsoever. They immediately just start swinging batons, beating the unarmed people there, including Danny. Was police brutality targeting gay people in the 60s a common occurrence, like the movie seems to imply? Absolutely. And the problem was you, you couldn't go to the police to complain about what was happening. So police operated with impunity. It wasn't for no reason that gay people fought back at the Stonewall Inn. They'd been abused over and over and over again by the police. So the scene that was portrayed in the film of Danny had gone to look for Ray in a part of New York City that doesn't really exist anymore. It was over by the piers on the Hudson River, where there were abandoned piers and an elevated highway, which has since been torn down. And underneath the elevated highway, there were trucks that were parked overnight, trailer trucks. And gay men would often go there for sex. Uh, I've read about this. I've never been there. I was too young for that. Plus, I'm, I'm germphobic and terrified of those things. So you never would have found me there. But the scene that was portrayed seemed pretty realistic. And I'm betting they got it from Martin Boyce, because Martin Boyce described that scene to me as well. And the police went in, they raided the area where people, gay people had congregated. And really, gay people didn't have, or gay men didn't have places where they could, could gather, you know, other than bars, which were owned by the mafia, and public places. So the scene, the only thing that, didn't, that struck me as inaccurate or, or ridiculous about that scene where Danny gets beaten brutally by the police is that, and they, they really pounded him with batons and punched him out. And the next day, he has a little cut on his lip. And within a scene or two, the cut on the lip is gone. So I think a little continuity issue there. If he had been beaten as badly as he was shown being beaten, he would have had broken ribs, broken limbs, and his beautiful face, which the camera lingers on quite often. I think they really were trying to uh, appeal to gay men like, like farm boys from the Midwest. Um, he would never have recovered as quickly from that, that beating, but that was not that was not uncommon. I have been told stories that were horrific um, about beatings at the hands of the police. Uh, the police were no friends to gay people, and you couldn't go to them to complain. I can't help but be reminded of a quote that we've heard a lot this year amidst the protests that we've had here in the United States. I don't remember. I don't remember it off the top of my head, the exact words, but this is the quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that says something to the effect of how a riot is the voice of the unheard. And it sounds like that's exactly what was going on with the Stonewall riot. The uprising was the only way that they could be heard. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Stonewall, in the movie, it does set up how the operation 
their runs itself. It, because this is Danny's first time as well in the movie, as viewers, we benefit because the group explains to him how this works. You know, you have to sign in. You can't use your real name. I you know, pause the movie and look, there's like Daffy Duck and John Wayne on the list, you know. <laughs> and then it says, as you mentioned earlier, you know, it mentions that Stonewall's run by the mom and there's no liquor license because it's illegal to sell alcohol to gay people. So how well did the movie do showing how Stonewall was ran? From my understanding of Stonewall and all the research I've done and things I've read, it was pretty spot on. Um, and the reason they set Stonewall up the way they did as a private club is because it was a, a layer of extra protection against the police. And so, yes, you did have to sign in and people signed all kinds of names, Judy Garland, Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse. Um, that seemed that 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 was one of the things that impressed me about the film. And there wasn't a lot that impressed me was how they got some of those key details right. There was plenty that it wasn't, but some of those key de t details were right. Some of it, though, oh my God, the guy who they had from the Madison Society and Frank Kameny, I was just, I know we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, we will get to that. Before we get to that, though, I do want to ask about some of the raids. We were talking about the, the police brutality and, and then talking about Stonewall. And when we see the group at Stonewall for the first time, there's a raid that happens. You know, the lights turn on, everybody lines up against the wall, IDs are required. It I get the sense while I was watching this, this is a very common occurrence. Everybody knows, okay, this is the routine, right? This is what we need to do. The movie mentions a, a three article of clothing rule and suggests that the cops are being paid off by the mob every time they raid the place, which of course, in my mind says, well, that's going to make them want to raid the place even more because they're getting paid for it every single time. Uh, how well did the movie do showing the raids on Stonewall? The film actually did a really good job of that, that that was the routine of how raids were conducted. The police were sometimes caught in between, uh, between politicians who wanted to publicize their efforts to clean up the city and clean up places like Times Square and clean up the village. And that usually meant get rid of the homosexuals and the prostitutes and the what would have been called then called transvestite prostitutes. We would never use language like that now, but but uh, cross-dressing people who sold themselves, uh, uh, um, sex workers. So that was accurate. And that the rule about three articles of clothing, yes, indeed, you had to wear three articles of clothing that were appropriate to your gender. So if you were a cisgender person, as we would describe them today, so I'm a cisgender guy. So at the Stonewall Inn, I'd have to wear at least three articles of clothing that were male identified. Now, my friend Martin Boyce said that he would carry receipts with him to show that the three articles of clothing he had on underneath his drag were indeed clothing that he had bought in the men's department of a, of a department store. So he carried those receipts. Wow. It's, I mean, that just seems like one of those laws that's it's there so that they can catch you for it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The one time you forget to carry the receipts with you, right? Or something like that, where, it, yeah, it's just there so they can catch you with it. Yeah, they debate, is that underwear? How masculine is that underwear? Or uh, for a, a woman who's in male drag, it's crazy stuff. And some of these laws date back years and have to do with ancient history in the U.S., but the, I always found the three article, um, I am wearing, I bought this shirt in a, in a men's department, just so you know, the one that you can't see because we're a podcast, but I'm wearing, um, although I don't know about these Birkenstocks, they're rather unis unisex. So. <laughs> yeah, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> well, earlier you mentioned the Mattachine Society, and I do want to ask about them because uh, there's a character there, Trevor, who is, according to to the movie, and uh, Trevor kind of mentions this, he, again, we have the benefit of Danny being new to the area, so, right, so he's explaining everything. Trevor explains that they're a group fighting for gay rights, and we also see, you mentioned uh, Frank Camney uh, speaking to the group at one of their meetings as well. Were they real, and were they a real group that was fighting for gay rights at the time? There was an organization founded in 1950 in Los Angeles by five men called the Mattachine Society. Over time, chapters spread across the U.S. The most radical of the chapters was founded in 1961 by Frank Kameny, who was a character in the movie. Frank uh, had a Harvard PhD, was an astronomer, had hoped to work for NASA, was fired in 1957 because he was gay. He challenged, he went to court, all the way up to the Supreme Court, which wouldn't hear his case, to try to get his job back. And when he couldn't get his job back, he founded the Mattachine Society of Washington, D.C. to fight the U.S. government, which eventually rescinded its ban on employing gay people in the federal government. So Frank won his battle. The way he's portrayed in the film is kind of silly, and the Mattachine Society is 
written off in a way as an old line organization that there are assimilationists, assimilationists and accommodationists and they have to wear coats and ties. And it's looking at that organization through the contemporary lens of 1969, you might think that they were an old fashioned group. But when Frank founded the Managing Society of Washington, D.C. in 1961, there were no protests out on the street. Frank is the one who initiated the first protest in front of the White House in 1965. And the reason he wanted everyone to dress appropriately, at least as he considered it appropriate, men in suits and ties, women in skirts and blouses and heels, he was arguing that gay people should not be discriminated against in employment. And he said, if you want to be employed, look employable. He also believed that your appearance shouldn't get in the way of the message. And that's why he had people dressed the way they did. The signs at all the protests were uniform. So it was a very careful branding effort for a people who had been largely hidden. Most Americans had never seen a homosexual before. But as the 60s unfolded, the 1960s, and young people became radicalized, young gay people felt that what the Madison Society was doing was old-fashioned. They shouldn't have to dress a certain way to protest. And eventually, because of, in large part because of the Stonewall Uprising, that earlier generation was swept away, and a new group of younger radical people came into the movement, and the movement exploded. It went from between 40 and 60 organizations to nearly 1,500 organizations in the first year after Stonewall. If Frank Kameny saw how he was portrayed in this film, he would be rolling over in his grave because he was, he was a real firebrand and he's portrayed as sort of this mousy guy in a suit talking before a group that applauded politely. And Trevor, who's kind of a cool version, cooler version of a managing member, kind of smoking hot guy who you just knew Danny from the Midwest was going to fall for. And he's just, he's portrayed as this manipulative user, but also an activist. I found his character particularly annoying and uh, repellent. What the, the guy who wrote the, the film tried to do was create a tension between Mattachine, the old line group, and the younger activists, which is actually a true tension. I just objected to the way he did it because, again, it seemed like such a cliche that Danny was betrayed by Trevor and Trevor found a younger man. And, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the gears grind so loudly in this film, you can just feel the index cards lined up on the, on the cork board. <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned Frank getting fired from NASA, and I think there was even a moment there where Danny's like, oh, I want to work for NASA when he, when he talks to him. And Frank, so I like that little detail there of that. It sounds like that part of it might have been, you know, an homage to Frank. Yes. Well, Frank had wanted to work for, for what was becoming NASA, but he lost his job and that was the end of it for him. Because any job in the federal government for an astronomer required security clearance and no person who was known to be gay could get security clearance. They ruined his career. Oh, yeah. Well, that probably, probably goes back to them being categorized as mentally ill, similar concept to, you know, teacher and, and that aspect. Well, no, that was that was because they could be the, the blackmail issue, less the mental illness issue. Oh, OK. Going back, I guess you mentioned to the the red scare and, and tying all that into it. And yeah, it stood out to me while I was watching the scene with Frank Kameny and, and the Mattachine Society. He said something to the effect of how the American people will start to understand that firing us just for being gay is plain wrong. And of course, it was this year, 2020, if you're listening to this in the future, that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled gay and transgender employees are protected under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So that just happened in 2020, but they're talking about this sort of thing in a 2015 movie set back in 1969, so it just seems like it's long overdue. Are there any other examples of similar decades-long fights just to get basic rights? Well, for LGB LGBTQ people, yes. Leaving aside other civil rights movements, uh, which took much longer even than for LGBTQ people, the right to serve in the military. The effort to remove gay people from the military began toward the end of World War II. The first protest about gay people in the military was in 1964 at the Whitehall Induction Center in the Financial District in New York City. It was, the, from what I understand, the first public protest by gay people ever. In, it was in 1964. And it was over gay people being thrown out of the military. And the argument was, if you're going to throw someone out of the military for being gay, at least give him an honorable discharge and don't ruin his life. So that was a battle that was fought for decades as well. And the issue of mental illness was also fought, fought over a period of time. 
I mean, it's just shameful that the issue about employment has taken this long, and there's still no law protecting gay people against discrimination, a national law against discrimination and accommodations. So in the cities and states where you're not protected by local laws, you can be thrown out of your apartment for being gay. Oh, wow. I guess I, I never realized that. That seems crazy. Or not served at a restaurant. Wow. So that's all up to the, is that state level? Is that city level? Or, or is that the establishment? It's state, or, it's state or local. It depends upon the state in which you live. Yeah. I'm no expert on it, but yeah, you can still run into problems. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there are these cases about bakers not wanting to bake cakes for gay weddings. I think I've seen stuff like that in the news. It, and it's just one of those shock. Like, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was like, don't you have better things to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, what, what is a gay wedding cake? He hasn't, he is, they aren't asking for a cake with their private parts reproduced on the top of the cake. It's just their names. It's a cake, yeah. It's a cake. What is a gay cake? <laughs> no, but I, I love that about the film. That was a 2015 film in which Frank Kennedy is talking about gay people and employment and discrimination. And here we are all these years later, and it was a decades-long battle to gain protections and employment. And it's not to be underestimated what a huge deal that is. Yeah, and I, I I appreciate your pointing out some of the uh, the other fights that are still ongoing that still need to be addressed for sure. Yeah, yeah. Going back to the movie, one of the villains, one of the main villains, I guess I should say, that we see in the movie is Ron Perlman's character, a guy named Ed Murphy. And as the movie explains it, Ed takes advantage of people, he pimps them out. We see this happening with Danny in the film. But then at the end of the movie, there's a bit of text at the very end that explains Ed Murphy ended up as a gay activist and was posthumously made Grand Marshal of the New York Pride Parade. How well did the movie do showing the character arc of Ed Murphy? Well, I wish I had done a better job of reading David Carter's book on Stonewall, because I'm guessing he went into detail about that. I'd always heard something about it, but the Ed Murphy I knew was the reconstituted Ed Murphy. So the film portrayed somebody who was, you know, there were gay people who took advantage of other gay people. It's, you know, we're just, we're human. We are equal opportunity opportunists. Well, like you said, like you said before, they're trying to earn a living, like they're trying to make their way. And unfortunately, sometimes that means putting other people down in order to survive. Yeah. So, so I learned something from the film. I'm hoping that it was close to accurate because, you know, Ed Murphy comes off as a, a terrible person. I'm guessing the scene where he pimps out this young Danny from the Midwest to an, an, an older gay couple, one of whom is dressed up like Ethel Merman. And for your listeners who don't know who Ethel Merman is, uh, go to YouTube and look up Ethel Merman. And that was how this older gay man was dressed up in their fancy apartment with his husband and, and trying to rip off the clothes of young Danny, who, who every time anyone tried to do to him what they portray in the film, he gets the same expression on his face of both a horror, a mixture of horror and oh my God, I can't believe this is happening to me. And we're supposed to imagine what's happening to him. And I mean, I, I, it was just a pathetic scene. But the, Ed Murphy figures into this because he's the one who's pimping out this young kid. I don't doubt that there were people like Ed Murphy operating in that environment at that time. So I have to go back and read David Carter's book. David Carter recently died. His book was, he spent 10 years writing a book about Stonewall. It is the definitive history of the Stonewall uprising and everything that occurred around it. So for anyone who's interested in knowing more, that really is the uh, the authoritative account. Speaking of the uprising, we're at the point in the movie where we see the uprising itself, or it's been called the Stonewall Riot in history as well. The movie has the date as June 28th, 1969. We mentioned earlier, Danny's the first one to throw the brick in the movie. <laughs> oh my God. I thought, first of all, Judy Garland, who for, for people who don't know who she is, she was a, an iconic actress, singer who was very popular among, especially gay men, she had a lot of gay fans, and is famous for the movie The Wizard of Oz. There's been much debate about whether or not her death, which coincided with the Stonewall Uprising, her body was on display the 27th of June at Campbell's funeral home on the Upper East Side. So people went to, to see her body, and then some of them went down to the bar. But it's not believed that her death had anything to do with it, and David Carter theorized that these street kids probably didn't even know who Judy Garland was or had no attachment to her in the way that older gay men did. Um, because the way it's portrayed in the film, it suggests that one of the characters, I think Ray, uh, goes uptown to see Judy Garland's body and that they're upset about her death. It's likely that that had nothing to do with it. But as I'm watching the scene unfold outside the stone wall, and you just know, you know, there's a riot that's about to occur, and I know how this plays out. And in one of the accounts, someone throws a rock that breaks a window. 
And I see Danny arguing with, I believe it was Conga, Conga Woman. At least that's how Conga Woman was known by Martin Boyce, and she's just known as Conga in the film. She takes a brick out of her bag, and Danny suddenly has the brick in his hand, and I'm thinking, oh, oh please don't. Danny, Danny shouldn't be the one to throw the first brick because it's going to ruin your life, screenwriter, if you portray the first person who throws a brick at the Stonewall Inn as a blonde boy from the Midwest. Because even if it was true, that shatters every myth about Stonewall. And it wasn't true. It wasn't a blonde boy from the Midwest who threw the first rock or brick. No one knows exactly who threw the first rock or brick. As with any riot or any uprising that gets started, wherever you're standing, there's a different perspective on what's happening. So as was described to me, what happened at first was people started throwing coins at the Stonewall Inn. And that was to say to the police, you came for your payoff? Here's some more. And I learned that from Sylvia Rivera, who is one of the people who was believed to be a participant of the Stonewall Uprising. I didn't know that detail. And the police were inside, right? Because in the movie, we see the police inside. So I'm just picturing this in my head. They're throwing coins at the Stonewall with the police essentially barricaded inside. Well, this is they're throwing the coins before the police are barricaded. Okay. At least that's how it happened. They're throwing coins. And what happens is there's somebody does throw a rock that breaks a, a window. I was glad to see that the way the filmmaker portrayed the uprising is pretty close to how it's been described to me by people who were there and by Lucian Truscott the fourth, who was a village voice reporter who was on the scene at the time, published the first or one of the first articles on July 3rd of 69, describing what he saw. Because as it's often portrayed now or described, it's described as a much bigger riot than it actually was. So people talk about Molotov cocktails and firebombs. And what you see in the film is the kids are squirting lighter fluid on the plywood behind the glass window that had been broken, and they set fire to the plywood. That's about the extent of how much flame there was. There weren't Molotov cocktails, there weren't firebombs. If you compare what happened at Stonewall in terms of riot ranking, Given what was going on in the 1960s, the late 1960s, with confrontations with the police and riots in the major cities, it was a very small uprising. What made it different was that it was gay people fighting back against the police. And instead of the police chasing gay people, you had these street kids who people thought of as weak and fearful. You had these street kids chasing the police through the village, and nobody could believe that that was happening. So that's what made it unique. And then the, the unrest went on for a total of six nights. It ebbed and flowed. But I was impressed that they, that they didn't overdo it. There's a kick line that's portrayed in the film of the kids doing a kick line and doing a chant. We are the Stonewall girls. We wear our hair and curls. We wear our jeans below our Nelly knees. There are various lyrics that I've heard. But as the Daily News wrote about it, and this is the New York Daily News newspaper wrote about it in 69, they suggested that it was a line of drag queens in full regalia and high heels and bouffant hairdos, which actually is a much better, I love that myth, better than the actual reality, which was it was street kids, some in mod modified drag. And when I talked to Martin Boyce, who was at Stonewall, about the high heels, he said, we didn't wear high heels to the Stonewall. You wore flats. You couldn't run from the police wearing high heels. So in that regard, I thought that the filmmaker did a good job of portraying the scene. And with the riot police with their shields and the batons, all of that I've heard described. Now, we can't compare it to actual film of what happened at Stonewall because there is none. You can't compare it to hundreds of photographs that were taken because as far as we know, there were a handful of photographs taken. Fa the most famous ones uh, taken by Fred McDera. There are five of them that I've seen. So we only know from accounts of it at the time of what happened. And the filmmaker, I thought, did a pretty good job of not overdoing it. I think his biggest mistake was having Danny the hero of the film, throw the first brick. But Danny serves a useful purpose, a storytelling purpose, because he is our eyes. He is the innocent coming from the Midwest, doesn't know anything about gay life or the village, and so we get to see it through his eyes. It just happens to be com completely made up um, and asking for trouble because the Stonewall Uprising is such contested history already that to portray it in a way that suggests the hero of the event is a blonde white boy from the Midwest, when in fact the street kids were from a range of races and ethnicities. And it was a big mistake to my mind. And you mentioned it went, went on for six nights, but we only really saw one in the movie. Was it all around the Stonewall or did it start to spread out a little bit more? It spread out into the streets of the village. 
so a year later, there was a, a pride march that was called the Christopher Street Liberation Day March on the anniversary, the one-year anniversary of Stonewall. It was specifically called the Christopher Street, which is where Stonewall is, Liberation Day March, because the year of activism that occurred after Stonewall was to liberate the streets of the village. They didn't want the focus to be on Stonewall because Stonewall was a mafia-owned bar that closed two weeks after the Stonewall uprising. So why would you celebrate a place like that? I mean, in the years since, it's become iconic. And around the world, people celebrate Stonewall, but all they know, really, most people, is that Stonewall was a place where gay people fought back against the police. It's, it represents freedom from oppression. One thing that I did quibble with in, in the film is they call it the, the Gay Liberation March in the film that occurs a year later, and they compress the timeline in such a way that suggests that it happened very quickly after the Stonewall Uprising, and that it just happened. And in fact, there was an enormous amount of organizing that went into that first march one year from the Stonewall Uprising, and it involved engaging with 20 different organizations, homophile organizations, on the East Coast that all agreed to that march. Actually, there's a longer story involved with that. If you have questions about it, I'm happy to answer that. That was actually going to be my next question, had to do with the march, because like you said, you that was something that really struck me about the movie, too. It happened so quickly. Like, the timing in the movie, you have the uprising, and then there's, like, a couple... Like, we see Danny go go home, he visits his sister, he's like, oh, we're going to have a parade next month to commemorate, and then a couple seconds later, they're having the parade. Boom! I thought that was next month, right? Yeah. I'm assuming this then transitioned into the pride parades that we see around the U.S. today is kind of how that went. Yes. Yes, I'll tell, I'll tell you how it happened in the shortest version of the story. So from 1965 to 1969, there was a march, it was called the Annual Reminder, in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia on July 4th, to remi- and this was organized by Frank Kameny and the Madison Society and several other organizations. It was to remind Americans that gay people didn't have their rights, that they could be fired from their jobs, that they could be thrown out of the military. So it was called the Annual Reminder. So the Annual Reminder was held on July 4th, 1969, just a few days after the Stonewall Uprising, like it had been every year. And that fall, in in November of 69, there was a meeting of the East Coast Regional Conference of Homophile Organizations. doesn't just roll off your your tongue here. It's ERCO. They met in November of 1969 in Philadelphia, and four young people, Ellen Broidy, Linda Rhodes, Craig Rodwell, and Fred Sargent, wrote up a resolution. These were young activists. They wrote up a resolution asking that the Reminder Day March be moved in 1970 to New York City to mark the one-year anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, and that the people who attended should be able to dress however they wanted, and that all the other organizations around the country should have marches as well and have them every year thereafter to mark the Stonewall Uprising. That's how we wound up with these celebrations and marches that occur every year either on the anniversary or around the anniversary of Stonewall, and sometimes at other times of the year. It was a well-organized, well-planned event, and it was called the Christopher Street Liberation Day March, not the Gay Liberation March. I don't know if Danny actually participated. Probably there were blonde boys from the Midwest who did, but it was a surprisingly diverse group of people, and it was the largest gathering of openly gay people in the world ever. There were somewhere between two and three or 4,000 people who marched from the village up 6th Avenue to Central Park, where there was a gay inn or a B inn, those were gatherings of people where that weren't organized. It was just a chance to be together and celebrate. And there were thought to be between five and 10,000 people at that gay inn in Central Park following the first march up Sixth Avenue. Wow. That's, I mean, that's pretty good attendance for the first, for the first one. Yeah. This is the, the reminder day marches got in Philadelphia got several dozen people. So no, this was, the, even the organizers couldn't believe what happened. That They started out actually with a few hundred people at the beginning of the march. And one of the chants was off the sidewalks into the street. And people joined the march along the way. And there's a scene in the movie that was just, it was so, so painfully cliched. So Danny's mother and sister show up. They've taken the train or bus from the Midwest to be at the march. And Danny sees his mother and sister on the side of, on the sidewalk. And his mother's gotten a new hairdo. And they look so happy. And of course, the father, who's the coach, uh, was not there. But I'm thinking, Danny go over and hug them. They came all the way from the Midwest to see you. And he just looks back and waves at them and keeps on marching. And I'm thinking, 
there's something wrong here. And, you know, I didn't get to write the movie, but if you're going to go, if you're going to go all in with the blonde kid from the Midwest, you got to have him hug his mother and sister who've gone all that way to see him in the march. <laughs> I agree. And that leads right into another question I want to ask. So if you did make this movie, if you did direct the movie, what's a key thing that you would change about it? Well, the problem is you know, <laughs> you'd have to change the main thing about it. So you have no move. I mean, there is a great movie, a great narrative movie to be made about Stonewall. So the stories are really something. And you can use the story as an entry point into what New York City was like in the late 1960s or the 60s as some of these characters grew up. And what was their life experience like? And how did Ray come to be on the street? How did Conga come to be on the street? Why did we have to have a blonde boy from the Midwest be the be the eyes to this story? So there is a, a terrific story to be told, but if I were to do it and I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't be the one to write it. I might assemble a team. I wouldn't be the writer. I would not have my eyes and ears or my guide through this piece of history be a blonde kid from the Midwest because you're just asking for trouble. Because kids of color played such a central role in the Stonewall Uprising. They were the kids who challenged the police first. They were what I describe as street kids, 15, 16, 17-year-old kids who had nothing to lose. So how do you make a movie about Stonewall when you center the story on a kid who's coming from the Midwest who's going to go to Columbia on scholarship? So that, I think, was a fatal flaw of the film. No one could see past that. But if you do see past that, then what you see is a film that's so laden with the, <laughs> the cliches that it's hard to really... Oh, it's just still Ethel Merman. Ethel Merman saw herself dressed up, someone dressed up as herself, um, stripping off a young boy's pants. Oh my God, it was just... <laughs> I mean, I have to thank you, Dan, for getting me to watch this film because I, I studiously avoided seeing it because I didn't want to be interviewed about it. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, you want to be interviewed about it? <laughs> well, the, the controversy is past. And I love that your podcast is about, is it looks at films that are trying to tell history, you know, allegedly true stories. It really was a well-intentioned effort, but, but it, couldn't, it couldn't help but fail by having this main character named Danny from the Midwest. As cute as he was, and he was cute as a bug's ear, and you just wanted to you know, take him home and introduce him to your grandmother. Um, but he was the wrong person to be the star of the film. One thing towards the end of the movie, we really got the idea, especially, you know, in the text at the end of it, it starts to talk about how even today, you know, 40% of all homeless youth in America are LGBT. Hom homosexuality remains a crime in 77 countries. One reason why I started this podcast was to help shine a light on different areas of, you know, we all know that movies are never going to be entirely true, but still, it's very easy to see it as, okay, this is this must be what happened or similar to what happened. And if nothing else, hopefully, this movie helps shine a light on that part of history. Yes, well, with, it does shine a light on the plight of homeless LGBTQ youth. And the life that they portray is the tragic life that many people still live today in New York City. So this is this is not the ancient past. This is this is how this is how people are living on the streets of New York today, and that is a, a terrible tragedy. Now, if you want to get a, a perspective for, for people who are interested in documentaries and, and and history portrayed in a documentary, to see how things are dealt with in other parts of the world, there's a new film called Welcome to Chechnya, which shows what's happening in Chechnya, which is a part of Russia where gay people are being hounded down and eliminated. They are trying, they say they don't have gay people in Chechnya. Um, and this film is about the people who are being hunted down, what's being done to them, and an organization in Russia that's trying to rescue and has been rescuing LGBTQ people and getting them out of Chechnya and out of Russia. It was, I saw it recently and it's so startling. It's, it's, it's shocking and horrifying. You can't believe that this is going on today, that people are being demonized and killed because simply because they're gay. Wow. It's easy to look back in, on history and be like, that was back then, right? And so everything is right now, but it's clearly not. What would you say to somebody listening to this that wants to help, and this clearly, you know, a global issue, uh, what would you say that they could do to help? Oh, there are so many ways to help and ways, and everyone has different ways of helping. You can volunteer for organizations that fight for LGBTQ rights. Um, if you're a parent of a, an LGBTQ child, you can get involved in an organization called PFLAG, which was once called Parents, Friends, Parents, Families, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. You can support an organization like Lambda Legal, which provides legal representation and fights cases that go all the way up to the Supreme Court. 
in every community, just about every community in the U.S., there are ways to get involved, whether you want to get involved uh, locally, nationally, or internationally. And there are organizations that need funding to help spirit people out of Chechnya to save them from being killed. But one key thing that I think is important for everyone to do is to, to be a little bit more informed than we are. Um, this history is only now just being taught in schools, in, in most places not. So it's hard to watch a film like the Stonewall film with a critical eye if you know nothing about the history. And I have to admit that when I started my work, I did a book called Making Gay History, which was published in 1992. It's an oral history of what was then called the Gay and Lesbian Civil Rights Movement. When I started my work, I had no idea that there was any movement history before 1969. I didn't know that it was founded in the U.S. in 1950, or that the first gay rights organization in the world was founded in Berlin in 1897, and that the first person, the first gay rights, gay rights activist to out himself was a German in, who outed himself in 1867 at a conference. There's lots of history, and it's really interesting history. And it's threaded throughout American history. The LGBTQ civil rights movement is, is American history. Just one story in particular that I find tragic that isn't taught routinely. One of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s principal mentors is a man named Bayard Rustin. He was also the principal organizer of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. He was an out gay man. And the reason we don't learn about him as part of the civil rights movement is that he was kept in the background, had to be in the background, because the fact he was gay and out uh, led to all kinds of problems with suggestions that he was having an affair with Dr. Martin Luther King. It was the FBI that, or J. Edgar Hoover, who promoted that rumor. So there are key people in history who we don't learn about because they were gay. And their stories have been, if not erased, they've been hidden. So we have the opportunity now to share these stories. And I was lucky enough to interview a lot of these of the people who were there at the very beginning of the movement, because when I started my work 30 some odd years ago, these people were still alive. And I was shocked to find that they were still alive. And I got to record their stories and then share them first in a book and then uh, now on a podcast, my Making a History podcast. That segues right into your work. And I know you've, you've got a lot of great books and you do have that excellent podcast, Making Gay History. Well, first, let me just say thank you for shining a light on those moments of history that I think sorely need to be highlighted more and more for sure. But can you share a little bit of information about your podcast and where someone listening can learn more about your work? Sure. At Making Gay History, what we do is we bring LGBTQ history to life through the voices of the people who lived it. And we do that by principally drawing on my archive of more than 100 interviews that I recorded for the two editions of my book, Making Gay History. We also draw on other archives, and we also have done some of our own research into finding uh, long-lost interviews, like with Bayard Rustin, which was on a cassette tape uh, in a box underneath the bed of his surviving partner, Walter Nagel, who very graciously let us use this incredible interview where Bayard Rustin talks about the impact of his sexual orientation on his work with Dr. King. I mean, it's an extraordinary interview, and we did an episode about it. And our podcast can be found at all the places you can find podcasts. And you can also find Making Gay History on our website at makinggayhistory.com. For each episode that we do, we do essentially a magazine article with links to lots of additional information, and we include archival photos. So for anyone who's interested in digging deeper, we provide the resources. We also partner with an organization called History Unerased at unerased.org to develop LGBTQ-inclusive American history curricula. Our work is done specifically for 8th and 11th grade American history classes. And I also work with an organization called Facing History in Ourselves that also develops resources for educators to use in the classroom. And also there's another organization called the One Archives at the USC Libraries. They're also developing resources for educators. What's happening now is that kids are demanding to be taught this history. And teachers and administrators are being forced to catch up. There are also state laws requiring it in some states in the U.S., but it's the kids who are, who are saying to their teachers, I want to know this history. And not just gay kids, straight kids too, who want to know what's, being, what's been kept from them. And some of these stories are just, just terrific. We also now have a Making Gay History play. It's called Making Gay History Before Stonewall. We had 10 performances in New York City at the Provincetown Playhouse in Greenwich Village. It was um, written by or adapted from my work by a professor named Joe Salvatore at New York University. And our last performance was on March 8th. New York City shut down just several days after we had our final performance. And we're now licensing the play to high schools and community groups. The first performance will be at a school in Chicago and then possibly a school in Vermont. And, it, and we, the story of, of the history before Stonewall is told through the stories of 20 characters, actually 20 real pay people. I'm the 21st character because I'm in the play as the interviewer, which was a freaky thing to see. <laughs> 
<laughs> are you playing yourself or you have other people that you get to cast as, as yourself? In this production, all 10 actors, 10 actors played, each played two different people. And each actor played me. So 10 different people played me. Yeah. So I was played by an African American lesbian, by a white cisgender guy, by, by an Asian American uh, guy. It was, it was something to see. It was, um, it was, it moved me to tears. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your time to come on and chat about Stonewall. I know I learned a ton and I'll make sure to add a links to all of your work in the show notes for this episode as well. Thank you. I just love talking about this. It was so much fun and I'm glad I got to see the film and I hope I never have to watch it again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on that note, thank you. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. I'd like to thank Eric Marcus for his time and expertise in helping us separate fact from fiction in the movie Stonewall. If you want to learn even more about the true story of what happened at Stonewall, Eric was kind enough to share a bunch of fantastic resources that he recommends for you. And of course, there's Eric's own podcast called Making Gay History that has an entire season, season five, dedicated to the Stonewall Uprising. You can find all those resources, as well as links to Eric's great books that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Danny Winters did not throw the first brick at Stonewall. Number two, the Stonewall Uprising was organized by the first gay rights organization in the world. Number three, the Stonewall Uprising led to the pride parades we see today. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. Danny Winters did not throw the first brick at Stonewall. That is true. And by true, I mean that Danny Winters did not throw the first brick of the uprising. As Eric pointed out, the character of Danny Winters is a fictional character and quite a problematic one since the implication the movie gives is of a white boy from the Midwest having a big part at Stonewall and it downplays all the people of color who were really involved in the true story. That brings us to number two. The Stonewall Uprising was organized by the first gay rights organization in the world. That is, that's the lie. As Eric explained at the end of our interview, the first gay rights organization was founded in Berlin in the year 1897, so long before the Stonewall Uprising in New York City in 1969. Now, if that was a surprise to you that the first gay rights organization was founded in 1897, well, it just illustrates how little of this history is known. That means number three is also true. The Stonewall Uprising led to the pride parades we see today. Eric gave us a great overview of how the uprising at Stonewall led to the pride parades today that shine a light on gay rights issues around the world. That's also why June is Pride Month, because the uprising at Stonewall started in June. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. I know that's not something a lot of podcasts do, and that's exactly why I'm doing it. I'm sharing this information. If there's one thing that is surprising to most people who are new to podcasting, or maybe they're not in podcasting at all, they've never created a podcast, it's the surprising thing is really just how much time it takes to create one. So I figure maybe if you find out more about how much time and money goes into creating a podcast like mine, maybe you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, today's episode took a total of 27 hours to create and cost $21.19 in out-of-pocket expenses. And as I always do, I want to make it clear that time and cost is only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 27 hours does not include the countless hours of my guest time researching the subject matter that we talked about. It also doesn't include the time it takes for me to do podcast-related things that are not part of creating this one episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain the Based on a True Story website, social media, the email newsletter, and all of the other little things outside of creating an actual podcast episode that are still required to make a podcast. 
Similarly, on the expenses side, that $21.19 is just for the things that are specifically for this one episode, which is going to be research material. It does not include all the podcast-related expenses that go beyond making a single episode. For example, the cost of the microphone I'm talking into, the cables that are hooked up to the microphone, the audio interface, the computer, the software, the software that Eric and I use to connect in order to record remotely, all the podcast and website hosting costs, and so on. All those things take time to set up and maintain and cost money. It goes beyond things that are associated with this one episode. But they are all things that are required because if I didn't do those things, there wouldn't be any episodes of Based on a True Story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for the wonderful people who are helping to support the show financially so we can keep it going. So if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping to support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a bonus, you'll get access to hours of exclusive content on the producer's feed. Right now, there are 54 minisodes over there covering a different fictional movie each time. For example, we just recently wrapped up four different minisodes with each one looking at one of the Indiana Jones movies and how they use real history and events to make them seem a little more realistic. But that's not all. We've covered history in movies like Pirates of the Caribbean, Jurassic Park, the entire Back to the Future franchise, and more recently, the classic film Forrest Gump, and so much more. There are hours and hours of bonus content available immediately, and plenty more planned and in the works, just as a way of saying thank you for helping to keep the lights on here at Base on a True Story. Once again, you can find out how to get access to that by supporting the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. In the meantime, if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll share it with a friend. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>